The Legend of Nakshagona by T. Crofton Croker In Tipperary is one of the most singularly shaped hills in the world. It has got a peak at the top like a conical nightcap thrown carelessly over your head as you awake in the morning. On the very point is built a sort of lodge where in the summer the lady who built it and her friends used to go on parties of pleasure. But that was long after the days of the fairies, and it is, I believe, now deserted. But before Lodge was built, or acre sown, there was close to the head of a hill a large pasturage, where a herdsman spent his days and nights among the herd. The spot had been an old fairy ground, and the good people were angry that the scene of their light and airy gambols should be trampled by the rude hooves of bulls and cows. The lowing of the cattle sounded sad in their ears, and the chief of the fairies of the hill determined in person to drive away the newcomers and the way she thought of was this. When the harvest nights came on, and the moon shone bright and brilliant over the hill, and the cattle were lying down hushed and quiet, the herdsman wrapped in his mantle was musing with his heart gladdened by the glorious company of the stars twinkling above him, bathed in the flood of light bursting all over the sky. She would come and dance before him, now in one shape, now in another, but all ugly and frightful to behold. One time she would be a great horse, with the wings of an eagle and a tail like a dragon, hissing loud and spitting fire. Then in a moment she would change into a little man lame of a leg, with a bull's head and a lambent flame playing round it. Then into a great ape, with duck's feet and a turkey cock's tail. But I should be all day about it were I to tell you all the shape she took. And then she would roar, or neigh, or hiss, or bellow, or howl, or hoot, as never yet was roaring, neighing, hissing, bellowing, howling, or hooting heard in this world before or ever since. The poor herdsman would cover his face and call on all the saints for help, but it was no use. With one puff of her breath, she would blow away the fold of his great coat, let him hold it never so tightly over his eyes, and not a saint in heaven paid him the slightest attention. And to make matters worse, he never could stir. No, nor even shut his eyes, but there was obliged to say, held by what power he knew not, gazing at these terrible sights until the hair of his head would lift his hat half a foot over his crown, and his teeth would be ready to fall out from chattering. But the cattle would scamper about mad as if they were bitten by the fly, and this would last until the sun rose over the hill. The poor cattle from the want of rest were pining away, and food did them no good. Besides, they met with accidents without end. Never a night passed that some of them did not fall into a pit, or get maimed, or maybe killed. Some would tumble into a river and be drowned. In a word, there seemed never to be an end of the accidents. But what made the matter worse, there could not be a herdsman got to tend the cattle by night. One visit from the ferry drove the stoutest-hearted almost mad. The owner of the ground did not know what to do. He offered double, treble, quadruple wages, but not a man could be found, nor the sake of money to go through the horror of facing the fairy. She rejoiced at the successful issue of her project, and continued her pranks. The herd gradually thinning, and no man daring to remain on the ground. The fairies came back in numbers, and gambled as merrily as before, quaffing dewdrops from acorns, and spreading their feast on the head of capacious mushrooms. What was to be done? The puzzled farmer thought in vain. He found that his substance was daily diminishing, his people terrified, and his rent day coming round. It is no wonder that he looked gloomy and walked mournfully down the road. Now in that part of the world dwelt a man of the name of Larry Houlihan, who played on the pipes better than any other player within fifteen parishes. A roving, dashing blade was Larry, and feared nothing. Give him plenty of liquor and he would defy the devil. He would face a mad bull or fight single-handed against a fair. In one of his gloomy walks the farmer met him, and on Larry's asking the cause of his down looks, he told him all his misfortunes. "'If that is all that ails you,' said Larry, "'make your mind easy. Were there as many fairies in Noxagona as there are potato blossoms in Elegerty, I would face them. 
it would be a queer thing indeed if i who never was afraid of a proper man should turn my back upon a brat of a fairy not the bigness of one's thumb larry said the farmer do not talk so bold for you know not who is hearing you but if you make your words good and watch my herds for a week on the top of the mountain, your hand shall be free of my dish till the sun has burnt itself down to the bigness of a farthing rushlight. The bargain was struck, and Larry went to the hilltop. When the moon began to peep over the brow, he had been regaled at the farmer's house, and was bold with the extract of barleycorn. So he took his seat on a big stone under a hollow of the hill, with his back to the wind and pulled out his pipes. He had not played long when the voice of the fairies was heard upon the blast, like a low stream of music. Presently they burst out into a loud laugh, and Larry could plainly hear one say, What, another man upon the fairies' ring? Go to him, queen, and make him repent his rashness. And they flew away. Larry felt them pass by his face as they flew like a swarm of midges, and looking up hastily, he saw between the moon and him a great black cat, standing on the very tip of its claws, with its back up and mewing with the voice of a watermill. Presently it swelled up towards the sky, and turning round on its left hind leg, whirled till it fell on the ground, from which it started in the shape of a salmon, with a cravat around his neck and a pair of new top boots. "'Go on, Jule,' said Larry. "'If you dance, I'll pipe.' And he struck up. So she turned into this and that and the other, but still Larry played on, as he well knew how. At last she lost patience, as ladies will do when you do not mind their scolding, and changed herself into a calf, white milk as the cream of cork, and with eyes as mild as those of the girl I love. She came up gentle and fawning, in hopes to throw him off his guard by quietness, and then took to work him some wrong. But Larry was not so deceived, for when she came up, he, dropping his pipes, leaped upon her back. Now, from the top of Noxagona, as you look westward to the broad Atlantic, you will see the Shannon, Queen of Rivers. Spreading like a sea, and running on it in gentle course to mingle with the ocean to the fair city of Limerick. It on this night shone under the moon and looked beautiful from the distant hill. Fifty boats were gliding up and down on the sweet current, and the song of the fishermen rose gaily from the shore. Larry, as I said before, leaped upon the back of the ferry, and she, rejoiced at the opportunity, sprung from the hilltop and bounded clear at one jump over the Shannon, flowing as it was just ten miles from the mountain's base. It was done in a second, and when she alighted on the distant bank, kicking up her heels, she flung Larry on the soft turf. No sooner was he thus planted than he looked her straight in the face, and, scratching his head, cried out, By my word, well done, that was not a bad leap for a calf. She looked at him for a moment, and then assumed her own shape. Lawrence, said she, you are a bold fellow. Will you come back the way you went? And that's what I will, said he, if you let me. So changing to a calf again, again Larry got on her back, and at another bound they were again upon the top of Noxagona. The fairy once more, resuming her figure, addressed him. You have shown so much courage, lords, said she, that while you keep herds on this hill, you never shall be molested by me or mine. The day dawns, go down to the farmer and tell him this, and if anything I can do may be of service to you, ask and you shall have it. She vanished accordingly and kept her word in never visiting the hill during Larry's life, but he never troubled her with requests. He piped and drank at the farmer's expense and roosted in his chimney corner, occasionally casting an eye to the flock. He died at last, and is buried in a green valley of pleasant Tipperary, but whether the fairies returned to the hill of Noxagona after his death is more than I can say. <laughs>